Well, welcome all to this uh, Pacific Zen uh, Luminaries series. Uh, tonight we have a really special guest. We have Kim Stanley Robinson. And Stan is a, a best-selling author. I'm sure you know him well. Uh, he's known for his science fiction, but also recently uh, he's been writing about uh, near-term science fiction, been writing about uh, global warming. And you probably know him for the Ministry of the Future and also he most recently published um, The High Sierra, A Love Story. So we're gonna cover those two books. But we also wanna go over some of his other works. Uh, he um, has written somewhere near 24 books, 23 or 24 books. And many, many of them have dealt with outer space. And I really love that image of, of standing on the earth and reaching for outer space. And, Outer space in Zen, as you know, is something that somehow we, we understand very, very well. So I'd like to start off with uh, Stan reading a poem, if you would, and it's called The Night Poem, 1988. And for me, it really brings together both earth and space. Well, thank you for that. Um, I will indeed, and it is... Um, a Sierra poem, and it is indeed from 1988, just sitting out before going to bed. Writing by starlight, can't see the words. Fill a page, nothing there. Waterfall, distant sound. Tree against stars. Milky Way, Juniper, Jupiter, white rock. Wind dying. My heart at peace, a Friday night. Big Dipper sits on the mountain. Friends lie in their tents. I sit against rock, star bowls spinning overhead. Feel the movement and soar away. Who knows how many stars there are, all those dim ones filling the black until it seems no black is there. And then you see the Milky Way. The sky should be pure white with stars. That's black dust up there blocking the view, carbon and hydrogen. All of us flung together in just this way. A blank white page, I write, and then a blank white page. It's the story of my life. <laughs> Indeed it is. That's great. And uh, when I first started reading your book several years ago, it made me immediately think of some some of these Zen quotes we have, like Ehe Dogen, uh, Zenji, who you've actually quoted in some of your books, he wrote, our mind is nothing other than mountains, rivers, and the great earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So I think we live in the same neighborhood, uh, Stan. Uh, but I'm really interested, and I'm sure others here are too, about what what brought you to writing and what where do you get your inspiration from? Well, I, I'm like many and many a writer. I came to writing from reading. I loved it. I began when I was a child and, and my mom read to me at bedtime. But I read myself from the moment I learned it pretty voraciously. And um, that gave me an interest. And occasionally I would try writing it. it it became quickly obvious that it was harder than it looked. But I I think that means that I had good judgment, uh, even of my own work right from the start. So I read intensively and I began by writing poetry um, with an interest in Shakespeare's sonnets. When I found I could manipulate the sonnet form and make something that was coherent, even though it was stiff and artificial and, and uh, beginner work, it, it was surprising to me that I could do it at all. So I began with poetry, and I think that's a very good way to start. Uh, uh, a modern American lyric poem, often it's just a page. You can work it over 20 times. You can toss it aside, and it's a, it serves as a diary entry to that time in your life, and you can move on to another one. And I did that for many, many years. And then I started writing short stories, and from the very start, they were, well, almost from the very start, they were science fiction stories. And I, I put that down to my Southern California youth and childhood. When I was a child, it was Orange Groves. When I was a youth, it was a city. And I saw the transformation. So when I ran into science fiction as an undergraduate, I became a convert to science fiction. 
at the same time i was reading gary snyder and then dt suzuki and getting uh uh powerfully impressed by i guess what you would call um uh american buddhism zen california zen whatever was going on this is the early 1970s it would between that going up to the sierras um running into the the early 1970s world of psychedelia um be here now by ram das immensely important to me i still have both copies here and an old battered one of my own that i got him to sign and a new one uh that is a better reading copy um zen mind beginner's mind that whole tradition of understanding california and my experience as a young man in california at, through the lens of um that whole tradition not just gary snyder although he was the organizer and the exemplary figure the person i could say i want to be like him so, well, um, there's, you yeah. have a really good story where you gave, um, uh, I think, a graduation speech, a commencement speech uh, before the English department at UC Berkeley or said, and you said, let's all shout at one time, at the same time, the author who most influenced us to be sitting here now. And everybody shouted hundreds of names and you shouted Snyder. Right. Yes. Yes. And I must say that was a an inspired thing I did on the spur of the moment, because afterwards at the reception, all these excited young graduates from UC Berkeley's English department scattering in the world. And, and that was my first question to all of them afterwards. You know, who did you shout out? What writer uh, or book mattered to you? And it was all over the map. One more than once. It was Ursula Le Guin. And then it would be you know, uh, Walt Whitman or, or Toni Morrison or um, Emily Dickinson, whoever it was, uh, Mark Twain, whoever had sparked them. Uh, it was interesting to talk about them and it was an angle in to a conversation with them. So I only did it the once, but I certainly would recommend it as something <laughs> to try again. And uh, you actually knew Ursula Gwynn personally, I guess. She was, she lived in Berkeley and, um... Uh, what kind of a person was she? She she was also considered a Taoist, the left hand of darkness, you know, which is the dark part of the of the uh, I Ching. Um, oh well, very much a a, a a literary person with a a, a strong sense of a Taoism balance of forces kind of person. Um, her father, Krober, was the anthropologist of the California Native Americans, and her mom wrote uh, Ishii, Last of His Kind. And this was a, a formative thing for her. And then she lived most of her life in Portland, Oregon, but grew up in Berkeley by a complete stroke of luck. She came to teach at UC San Diego when I was a graduate student there. And so I had a month with her in a master apprentice writing workshop style system, which we both understood because of Milford and Clarion, this had become common in the uh, American science fiction circles. Uh, indeed, it kind of originated there. And she was a, a great teacher. She was very uh, quick, funny, unassuming, modest. I remember parties where she was sitting on the floor, uh, a rather small woman, I remember her uh, submitting one of her stories for a critique to the group, just like everybody else in the group, because the Milford Clarion style is kind of group style. You put a story out there, everybody makes their comments, you talk about it, then you move on to the next one. So it's hands-on workshopping. Um, and we, uh, as a class, we went down to see this new movie, the Star Wars, and she was sitting on my left as we saw Star Wars for the first time in 1977, and we laughed hard. Uh, at its silliness. And I stayed in contact with her the rest of her life. And I can say that she uh, read my work and we I read hers, of course. And um, it was late in her life that we became close friends. Before that, it was kind of just like I was one of her students and one of her students who had gone on to become prominent. And so there was a maybe uh, an 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 aunt and nephew type relationship with her 
and I, I, I wouldn't want to overemphasize it as a close relationship, but near the end of her life, we did a reading together at Oregon State University, and we, we planned it carefully. Uh, we each read for five minutes. We tossed it back and forth for an entire hour, and in the middle of it, I read for five minutes from her work. She read for five minutes from my work, and she read from my novel Shaman, the old shaman in the, on his last days on his deathbed speaks to his apprentice um, some words of wisdom to pass on in a world that only had oral knowledge. There were no written records. Well, I would not have dared to. I've never have read that passage and wouldn't have dared to. It, it would be too hard for me. And she read it like nails and the hair was standing up on the back of my neck. Uh, it never occurred to me that she was really reading a thing that somewhat related to our own personal relationship as a, a, a maestro and student. Mm. But that was certainly a, a precious moment for me. Mm. Philip K. Dick, too, he was your PhD, subject of your PhD thesis. And in some ways, some of your works uh, have been sort of um, revisionist history. Um, a year of Sultan and uh, uh, a year, a year of uh, a, a year of rice and salt, I guess, where where a pandemic wipes out all of Europe and and the Buddhists and the Islamists become the major forces in you know in the modern earth and uh, and all the interesting things of that. Uh, but that very much like man in a high tower in a in a high castle, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Alternative history is a subgenre of science fiction. It's pretty interesting, especially if you like history. What if something profound? It happened differently in the past, what would the world become? And I figured with the Europeans all dead in 1400 that Christianity would die, the European conquering of the world wouldn't happen, and there was a chance for Buddhism to become a guiding strand of world history, which maybe it's been anyway. But in this novel, it was China with its triple strand of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. Uh, and then a, a kind of a stronger Buddhism in India than there than there is in this world. And then the Islamic um, Dara, Dar al Islam, all of the uh, Islamic nations as a kind of conglomerate. It was a novel of, that in many ways was about religions and their impacts on history. And, and by far the, the most that I have ever focused a novel on that kind of theme it's very important to me and a chance to write about a lot of things that I love. So, yeah, a strange offshoot, a sidebar in my career, but it is kind of a brick of a novel and it was yeah. and it's, it's still very important to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think you said in one interview is maybe one of your favorite, your favorite novels. But, uh, of my own. It yeah. Has, yeah, yeah. Um, and so. Buddhism runs through a good chunk of your writing. I don't know what the count is, but maybe a quarter or a third of your books, you know, mention Dalai Lama or Buddhism, some one form or the other. Uh, I'm really interested, and I've been sort of researching your Buddhist practice, you know, your personal Buddhist practice, which doesn't necessarily appear so much in your novels, but um, you're, we were talking a little earlier, you had said before that you're not really a Buddhist, but you're Zen and, but your, your strong ethical current is Zen and you, you're actually meditating where I've seen, I've read that you, you were not meditating. I'm, I'm really interested in what's going on right now in your, yeah. in your Zen practice. Well, I am happy to talk about this. And so thank you for the opportunity because it's, um, believe me, it's not, it's important to me in my personal life. It's not something I get a chance to talk much about in my life as a science fiction writer and now as a public intellectual working mostly on climate. But in my daily life, it never goes away because of um, uh, chop wood, carry water. So I'm that kind of Zen. I, I've never raised kids too. you also said, well, that's true. <laughs> Wash the dishes. Um, it goes on and on like that. If daily life becomes devotional practice, you are in a better space. And uh, suddenly things that many people would consider to be a hassle, sweeping the floor, doing the laundry, they become devotional practice in that Zen sense. This is um, 
a magic turning of the key in daily life for a suburban American guy who was mostly a Mr. Mom. Uh, to have that attitude towards it, I find profoundly calming, pleasing, uh, a kind of um, the art of life that's a make your life into a work of art. Um, and so devotion to what? Well, to reality, to paying attention. I don't bother much with that. I was never good at sitting meditation. When I was sitting meditating, I was always furiously distracted by other things. And so I, I gave up on it. This is when I was very young. I thought, well, I can't do that. What I can do is I can walk all day very happily. And there is a walking meditation in Japan, those people who walk around the mountain. And, um, and so running can become a form of meditation for sure. And I can t tell you a story about my daily practice now. I just did it today. Me and my friend Neil, uh, a prince among men, we go down to the local park that has a Frisbee golf course on it. Now, Frisbee golf is a silly game, like golf itself, uh, pointlessly um, finicky. You got to get the Frisbee into the baskets and you score it like golf. And the people doing it still, very few of them, are mostly, you know, carrying a an extra bag on their hip for beer cans and they're smoking cigarettes. And it's a, it's like golf itself, uh, one of the least impressive of, uh, of world sports. But if you run it, so you throw the Frisbee, you run after it, you pick it up, you throw it at the thing. We play 54 holes of running Frisbee golf. It takes about 40 minutes, um, plus or minus. And in that 40 minutes, we are not there. We have. I say it this way, we have become dogs. Because you know how dogs are chasing Frisbees in the park and they leak up to catch them. And think of that dog's mind. That is a Zen mind. That dog is focused on the Frisbee and on the joy of running and being alive. And that's what we become for an hour a day, almost every day, every day that we're both home in Davis, because we both travel a bit. But when we're both home, we both play. This comes to 150 days out of every year. We've been doing it for 25 years. And the more we do it, the more we get there and we just say, aha, Sunday morning in church or you know, Wednesday evening in church. For many years, we had to play at night and we played in darkness with no problems. And I'm going to say this. I, wrote, I actually wrote about this as Buddhist practice, as, as a meditation technique for, uh, I think it was... Um, I'm not sure which one of the Buddhist magazines it was. Uh, Shambhala is not a magazine. Maybe I think it, it, Lions it was Tricycle. 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 Lions Roar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but they turned my this article down. It wasn't <laughs> Buddhist enough for them. So I was regretted that. I've never published that article, but I certainly live that life. And um, to conceptualize it as devotional practice is is to um, understand better the the joy of it. And so I feel enriched by the Zen tradition of chop wood, carry water. And now I want to go on a little bit because one time I went down to a conference on overpopulation. So that shows you how long ago that was. It was in the 91 or 92 at Green Gulch Zen Monastery in Marin County. And um, Ernest Kallenbach and Fritjof Capra had rented it as a uh, conference space, which is possible there. So it wasn't a Buddhist conference. It was a group of political luminaries trying to conceptualize world peace by way of uh, acknowledging there were maybe too many humans. It was a, actually, now that I look back on it, probably the wrong way to go at world problems. And a couple of the people there pointed that out right in the conference. So it was very lively. But also, we saw the way that they lived at Green Gulch. And I'm going to say this. I didn't like it. It was too rigid. They said their prayers as if they were robots in a chant together. And their garden was over-gardened. It was um, rigidly weeded. The plants were all perfectly spaced from each other. The, the little trees were espaliered to within an inch of their lives. I thought to myself, this isn't my Zen. This is some kind of um, come to America and prove that you're even more zen -y than the Japanese. Although I hear the Japanese can be very rigid themselves. So I had no way, I, I, I didn't have the education or the experiences to be able to judge it um, in any a comparative context, in any uh, history of, of uh, California Buddhism or world Buddhism. I, I, I didn't know enough, but I knew this, that's not my style. 
And I, since then, I, when people ask me, especially when Years of Rice and Salt came out, uh, are you a Buddhist? I'd say, yes, I am a uh, hippie, new age, California Buddhist. And I take it that the Dalai Lama would approve perfectly well. But I, I wanted to de-emphasize the, the nature of my Buddhism. And, and so, although it's more than fellow traveler, it's less than the various formal traditions. And it's just, I think that's okay. Everybody gets to carve out their own practice. If it, uh, and, and as long as you've got the basic precepts as your guide for action, that you're living them, then, you know, this is a, I, I, I'm convinced that the Buddhist, the Buddha would agree. In fact, the way he would slap around some of his disciples, I'm certain he would agree. Yeah. Of course, yeah. make up your yeah. own. Yeah, I, I think, Stan, it's, it's more than okay because there's no way that you can come to awakening except through who you are, right? And the whole Buddhist practice for us, at any rate, I can't speak for others, is, is just realizing that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to read something uh, about your first hundred yards hiking into the Sierras, You've done over a hundred trips to maybe many more than a hundred trips now to the Sierra. I mean, it's it's been such a central part of your life. Yes. And this was your first trip. And you're a hundred yards in, and your friend at the time, Terry, gives you a tab of acid to draw. Yep. And you write, what struck me most that day and and has lingered since in me with a stupendous sensation of significance. It seemed to me that this mountain range I found myself in was more than real. I don't know what it meant by that. I, I still don't. Neither is spiritual or mystical or metaphysical or existential, though all these words reach for the feeling. Naturally, the ineffable and the inexpressible are also appropriate, given the elusiveness of feeling or its inexpressibility. I keep coming back to my original formulation. What I was seeing was more than real. That's the feeling that struck, stuck with me and has never gone away. More real than real, the real reality, something like that. Yes. Thank you for that. That's Stan Zen. Yeah. And, and of course, I, I think it's um, interesting to talk about um, the psychedelic origins. Now, I have to say, I was prepped. I had been reading D.T. Suzuki and um, Aldous Huxley and Ram Dass before that experience, which was about midway through my experiences with psychedelia. And it was exactly 50 years ago this summer. And in August, I went with my wife. By a complete coincidence, we drove by the trailhead that I went up those 100 yards. I actually hiked those that trail 50 years later, and it's remarkable what a innocuous and rather uh, ordinary, unspectacular Sierra trailhead entry that it is. Um, but it's as good as the rest. It's granite. It's uh, uh, evergreens. It's beautiful. But it isn't as uh, gigantic as I saw it at the time when it was my first time. That's it. But, was that Eagle Falls? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. Right there at Emerald. Emerald. And yeah. and up yeah. towards uh, yeah. past Eagle Falls and up towards mm -hmm. the Velmas, all yeah. in my uh, you know fifty years later in my old age, a much more modest and teeny little hike that my wife and I just waltzed up and down on a day hike that was only a few hours long, and luckily there was wind and rain and it felt kind of weathery and magnificent and of course nostalgic as hell, but it wasn't overwhelmingly monstrous like that first day i thought i might be if you were in the upper himalayas or on the 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 mountains of the moon it could not have been more spectacular and but i i want to say that uh, the psychedelics of that time for me it was stupid to take things when we didn't know exactly what we were taking that has to be admitted but it, when you were reading the right um kind of semi-religious semi-transcendentalist uh literature about the experience to frame it and then going off on these argonautic adventures that would be, you know, 24 hours or so and come back and say, what was that? And have to think about reality because it had gotten so odd for the for those hours. And then it's just like Ram Dass says in Be Here Now, at a certain point, that experience 
you've had it. It becomes repetitious. If you do it again, it's almost being self-indulgent. You should be able to get all of the important feelings of that experience without the drug. And I think he was right. Uh, he was a wise man, a good man. And um, about, so that was 73. And around at the end of the 70s, for many reasons in combination, I just quit uh, that uh, psychedelics and many other drugs. But it was all a, a case of, I'm done with that. And there was even a certain revulsion of like, why, why, why should you have to uh, poison yourself in order to get high? Can't you just do it by thinking about it? And I found, yes, I could. It was, and and getting high isn't even the right way to put it. I could be in the space all the time by um, some luck of biochemistry. I have to say, that comes, I'm certain, from my mom, and then some kind of uh, spiritual practice to to uh, train that senses. And then also a sense of social awareness, a sense of history. Uh, what am I in relation to other people? What's my job in life, et cetera, et cetera. It's a social thing as well as an individual spiritual thing. So I, I'm very pleased. I had, a, I had a glorious 70s youth, very crazy, very uh, profound. It shaped me and, uh, and the, it's gone on since then with a certain shapeliness. That it that really still includes those those uh, Zen moments of my of my early twenties. Yeah, what 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 struck me? I mean, a lot of people have dropped acid, obviously, and had you know experiences. But what struck me in that quote was a feeling stuck with me has never gone away. More real than real, you know. Even the mundane entry into that trail is beautiful, just in its own way. Um, I, I'd love you to read something by Clarence King, who um, I think Kings Canyon is named after, right? And uh, that whole that whole area, um, which you've gone over something less than, you know, two hundred mm -hmm. times. Yeah, um, um, yeah. Um, in fact, Kings Canyon is named uh, the Spaniards named them after the three kings. I guess the Magi because they uh -huh. saw the mountains um, on some uh, Christian holiday. So that's the kings of Kings Canyon. Clarence King had the same name, but he came at Sierras from the other side. Well, no, he came from the west side. Um, he was with Brewer in 1864. They were doing an exploration for the California Geological Survey. And Clarence King was a, a strange, uh, lively, and uh, charismatic man. Uh, short but energetic. He wrote a fair bit, although almost everything that he wrote that was worth anything is in one collection called Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada. And he was said to be a, te a, teller, of, a teller of tall tales, but the more people investigate his tall tales, the more it, it comes to seem that he was just accurate and saying what he saw, and people had never seen anything like it before. So when he got to the, he tried to get to the top of Mount Whitney by accident, because they had no idea where they were. He got to the top of what we now call Mount Tyndall, six miles north of Whitney, looked south, saw Whitney, knew he was somewhere else. And indeed, in the years that followed, he tried many times to get to Whitney. He missed it to the south after missing it to the north, et cetera, et cetera. But on his first time up here, he, he tries to describe what it was like. And he says, the serene sky is grave with nocturnal darkness. The earth blinds you with its light. That fair contrast we love in lower lands between bright heavens and dark, cool earth here reverses itself with terrible energy. And I said about this, this catches something essential, the range of light. Up here, the rocks seem to glow from within, to pulse with an internal light under a sky as dark and solid as enamel. So this, I think, is, is um, Clarence King paying attention and writing honestly what he saw rather than going into the cliches of American Victorian uh, landscape description, of which there was many by that time. This was, uh, well, it was early on, 1864. But he was being honest about what he saw and really reporting. And so the whole page, it's actually the description goes on about two pages. And I think what I read is the heart of it. Those two pages are kind of fantastic because he's 
incoherent. He, he tries over and over again to express it, and it is inexpressible. So he keeps battering away at it with these uh, sentences that are a little wild. It's really the two best pages he ever wrote because he was confronting such an amazing reality and doing his damnedest to convey it to your ordinary American reader of the 1870s. Well, it's a it's a wonderful experience, and and and, and he was right. There is a feeling that the high Sierra being white granite, you know, mostly silica, and you're up at uh, 12, 13, in this case, 14,200 feet. The sky is really dark. The the rocks are really bright and seem to glow. So he's right. There is a reversal of energy that is um, striking. And uh, it's one of the reasons, like if you struggle for reasons to explain why the high Sierra is so magical, that simple physical fact is is part of it, I think. Yeah, nice, nice. And one thing I really like about, we're talking now about the High Sierra. Um, one thing I really love about this book is how you demonstrate that the Sierra for you was almost the crucible for for your whole life. You you wrote a poem after you split up with your, your first wife and, and the world was looking pretty bad to you, right? And here you were in the Sierra and you passed, uh, you crossed uh, Mather Pass and the last Sanda says, I passed two hikers setting camp. Did you come over in that storm, over the pass in that storm? And you said, yes, I left my life on the other side and now I'm not afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was 1980. And just a couple months ago, I was at the on the Muir Trail at Lower Palisades Lake, where I ended up on the day that I wrote that poem. And I I went uh, uh, past the place where on the next day I took off uh, cross country, I went underneath Palisades Basin and across Doozy Basin going cross country. I had done a little of that through the 70s, but um, this was almost like a breakaway, breakaway from the trail. And at this point, the John Muir Trail is sort of like the Highway 5 of, um, of the Sierra Nevada. Too many people on it. It's a little bit sad the way people fixate on uh, a single thing that they can name up there when they could actually be wandering freely. But I, I want to give it credit. The people doing it, they're on a pilgrimage. So there is also something religious or sacred about a pilgrimage. And, and um, as pilgrimages go, that's a pretty damn good one. But yes, I just saw the space that I was writing about there just this summer. And again, earlier, I saw the place in up near Tahoe. So I had a good Sierra year, rather um, limited compared to years past. But nevertheless, as I get older, the more precious my days up there seem to me, because there aren't going to be that many more of them. You have to be lucky. You have to be alive, for one thing. You have to be relatively nimble uh, and spry uh, for another thing. And so I don't feel like, I feel like I'm, uh, it's inevitable that I'm close to the end of my Sierra career as I knew it, as a rambler and scrambler in the high country going off trail. Well, um, I'll just keep doing it. This is another value to, you know, this one, that's another thing about Zen that I find lovely and important in my life is, look, you're really in the present. You can think about the past, you can think about the future, but always you're in the present when you're doing it. And this is, seems to me fundamental in Buddhism is to say, all right, the human mind can wander widely, but don't forget you're in the present at all times and what's there and what can you do in it? And isn't what you're doing in it kind of central compared to your thinking about past and future? Well, uh, yes. And it's a lesson that is so easy to forget and to drift away from. And the mind is just racing, my mind, and I think everybody's. Oh my God, I'm remembering these great days in my past. Oh my gosh, I've got 20,000 things to do in my future. And if you think of them all at once and stack them, you can think, oh my God, it's overwhelming. But in the meantime, you know, you're washing dishes or uh, watching the cat, doing stuff in the present that is as good as anything that's going to come in the future. So why not stay focused on it? So here again, I, I love the impact that Zen thinking has on my life. 
everybody amongst you knows this. It's just, it's a sanity. It's a form of sanity. Uh, it helps. It helps you, and I love it for that. Mm. Nice. <laughs> um, you um, you went to the movie called Meru in the in the High Sierras, and and I. I want to get, it was a very emotional movie for you. And I wanted to get a sense of what was, what was going on there for you. So you go to the movie, you come out, or Meru is about, it's about climbing. It's about rock climbing, free climbing, right? Pretty much. And uh, Jimmy Chin is the producer and he's, he did uh, more free climbing um, movies, incredible producer of movies. But, um, somehow you come out and you, you, you were clutching your wife's hand and trying to express to her what had hit you so hard. You're quivering. You could barely talk. And you said they can't help themselves and they can't choose to do that stuff. It's just them. In other words, put their life in danger, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't get to choose. Um, what can you yes. help us a little bit more with what was going on there? Yes, yes, uh, I can. And, and thank you for that, uh, um, bringing up that line of thought. Uh, I'm not a climber, and I've always been intensely judgmental against climbing. And I don't like the way mountain reality has been, in the popular mind, overwhelmed by um, climbers and thoughts of death. So that the mountain, what's the, what are the mountains about? Well, it's about young men uh, with a lot of testosterone going up there and risking their life in order to get thrills. You don't need to risk your life to get thrills. So I thought of them as a little um, jaded or uh, blunted in their sensibilities or um, over sophisticated to the point where nothing else pleased them. So in, you know, instead of looking at a sunset or enjoying washing the dishes at the sink, they had to be hanging by their fingernails from a cliff and they would die if they made a mistake. And to me, this was, um, um, uh, what's the word? It was um, excessive and maybe decadent. That's the word. It was de a decadent pleasure. They were at a, such a blunted sensibility that until their lives were in danger, they couldn't even focus. Like they were very bad Buddhists. Like they had to be uh, uh, clinging to their lives before they were in the moment itself. And of course, if they were really in the moment then because if they made a mistake, they would die. The stakes are too high. Yeah. And even, even if they were childless and unmarried, they always had parents. And usually- Well, you know, an interesting thing, Stan, is that so often you bring that that mindset to to your novels. For example, in Aurora, when people get a 2,500 people climb on a ship for a multi-generational uh, exploration out to a far, far galaxy, they're hanging off that wall, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, aren't they taking that risk? When the first hundred went to Red Mars, you know, to establish a colony there, they're hanging on, the forces around them are far, far greater than they are. And the risk that they're taking is is huge. And I think it's really interesting because you feel that and you put that in your, in your novels, you know? Well, it's true, but I will make distinctions here. Um, you know, uh, going to Mars, the astronaut urge, it's another planet. It's fascinating. It's interesting and beautiful. Scientists, I mean, I've been to Antarctica. It's like an extension of going to Antarctica. You would die in Antarctica without heavy duty tech support in just a few hours. And it's the same or worse on Mars. You, we can't get to another star system. And if we put a bunch of humans inside of a, a rocket ship and send them off to even the closest stars, which is Tau Ceti, um, which has planets around it, 10 light years, it would take a couple hundred years to go. There would be people born in that ship that didn't choose to be there. And Earth is really our our mother, our body. And those people are cut off from it. It's a prison novel. We, we are not going to go to the stars. And I wanted to make that statement to the science fiction community and slap them around uh, with reality a little bit. We're not going to the stars. Earth is our one and only home. Mars is poisonous. Um, and, and useless. The moon, likewise. There's nothing but Earth. And this is an important point to make in our moment of peril uh, in environmental terms. Now, to bring it back to the personal, climbers, when they risk their lives just to get thrills, well, they are paying attention in a most 
profound and existential way. And what what caught me in that movie was by watching three climbers talk right into the camera. They're not decadent because they're not choosing it. They're not jaded people with a blunted sensibility. They're under a compulsion. So in a way, they're they're crazy people, and they aren't they aren't trying for the Buddhist moment of attentiveness to the moment. They are under a compulsion to put themselves at high risk because they might be focusing ADD or blah, blah, blah. I don't want to medicalize it, but in a philosophical sense, if you, I was before that movie, I always judged them. Oh, my God, they're such fools. After that, I had to say, look, uh, you, can't, you can't criticize them for being the way they are because they don't get to choose they are well under in, a, in a way they must be who they are just like stands yeah buddhism must be what it is right well they're they're under a compulsion and so um i think this is a very bad um a status for the people who love them they have to say ah yes my beautiful friend whom i love jimmy chin or my partner um uh alex lowe um, I love them with all my heart. Boom, they're dead yeah. beca uh, because an avalanche ran over them or because a rock broke. They can be incredibly skillful and never make a mistake and still be dead because of where they wanted to be. And I think if you love them, you just have to say, well, what if somebody had a kind of a disease that was that was maybe like a heart disease where they could fall over dead at any moment? It's not their fault. You love mm -hmm. them anyway. You hope they don't fall over. And with the climbing compulsion, if you reach about the age 50, you kind of age out of it. Yeah. So if they survived age 50, they're going to be OK. <laughs> yeah, um, I love all those movies, 14 Peaks, et cetera. But uh, so Ministry of the Future, I wanted to make sure we we get a good piece uh, carved out of this. Uh, could you give us just the quick overview of Ministry of the Future, perhaps for people who um, have have not yet read the book? Sure. Um, it, it came out in October of 2020. I wrote it in 2019. So I wrote it before the pandemic and it came out during the pandemic, um, which I think is germane to what happened, which is that it took off at the end of 2020 and became, for my um, scale and level, a, a bestseller, but widely read by people all over. And suddenly I was getting invitations like I'd never gotten before. These were people who didn't typically read science fiction. And for many and many of them, it was the first book of mine they had ever read. And that's fine. It's a I write all my books with the sense that anybody should be able to pick them up, whether they know even one bit of science fiction. You can pick up my book on page one. It explains itself to you. So I'm a novelist who wants to be read by the general public, and I don't like the esoteric nature of, of um of community science fiction. So ministry is about um, the, uh, the Paris Agreement has the ability to set up standing committees that are year round. And they set up one that gets nicknamed the Ministry for the Future saying, uh, the climate change problem is so bad that we want you to go at it from the angle of defending the people that will be alive in the future generations and also the wild animals that can't speak for themselves. And so it's the nickname, the Ministry for the Future, from the popular press. And it's a relatively small agency, but actually, now that I look back on it, I see that I gave it a pretty damn big budget compared to most federal and international agencies. And for whatever reason, they began to get some traction on the problem of climate change and biosphere destruction because people are terrified and they need to organize their efforts. And the ministry be uh, its its leader is a woman, a character named Mary Murphy. She's based on Mary Robinson and Christiana Figueres and Christine Lagarde and uh, Laurence Tubiana and Angela Merkel, some powerful um, European woman doing top level international diplomatic work. And my Mary quickly realizes that her second in command, an Indian Nepali man, um, is maybe running a little black wing on the side to forward the cause without telling her about it. This happens a lot in government, and she's Irish and she knows that. Uh, and so the book goes on from there, really, except there's a crucial moment. It starts with a heat wave in India that kills millions, and that's all too possible. And a, 
an American aid worker comes out of that situation alive, but traumatized. And one night he kidnaps Mary Murphy and says, you're not doing enough. Uh, you're going too slowly. The world's going to cook. You've got to go faster. And then he escapes into the night and she has to figure, she agrees with him. She realizes he's right. She realizes she's just gotten away, not being murdered by a madman, but being warned by a extremely traumatized survivor. And the book goes on from there. And I can finish by this. It's a kind of a story of all the things we could do right if we were motivated and if we got lucky. And it's a kind of a best case scenario in which a lot of bad things happen, but the preponderance of the historical movement is towards the good. By the end of the book, we have less carbon in the atmosphere and we're beginning to um, get a handle on the climate crisis. And then there are many other problems that are outstanding. This is not a pure utopia, but it's kind of a best case scenario. Yeah. And I'm I'm positive that's why it has had the impact it has had in the world. It's a best case scenario that people still believe in when they finished reading it, uh, more or less. Uh, it's there. You always argue about books, especially future books, especially utopian future books. So it's a a, a tool for arguing, and it's a kind of a sketch of a plan. And that's the ministry for the future. And I have spent the last three years traveling the world, but luckily mostly by Zoom talking to people all over the world about it. And I see this, I'll end with this. People are hungry for a story like that one. They're not seeing it elsewhere in the culture. If you say, well, I wanna believe that we can get to a good place. Let's let's model that in a story. You don't see that story. And so in a way the, the book is filling an, a somewhat empty ecological niche in our culture. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to ask you more because you're talking to groups like this all the time. You've got a, a very full schedule, just got back from a couple of weeks in Europe uh, talking to people. Yeah, that's true. And, and could you just elaborate a little more on, on what people are saying to you, perhaps? Yeah, um, sometimes I'm meeting with um, uh, book clubs, sometimes I'm meeting with political groups, sometimes I'm meeting with groups like yours. In fact, tomorrow night I meet with a, an Episcopalian uh, group. It's kind of beautiful from Zen to Episcopalians. They're about as Zen as um, Protestants get, so it's okay. Um, and I was brought up Lutheran myself. Uh, but at the policy level, what's interesting is I, I spoke to the World Trade Organization, to the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, the OECD, then also the European Union. I spoke at COP26 and I talked on Zooms to reinsurance companies and investment firms, hedge funds, um, the uh, central bankers. It goes on and on and on and on. And I guess what I would say is these people, I'm puzzled by what they want out of me because it's really my book that has the news. So when I want to talk to them, it has to be, um, I have to do something that is probably familiar to you all. I turn the tables or it's holding up a mirror. It, it's maybe something that is out of Buddhist practice, maybe. It's also dialectical, but Buddha was very dialectical. What do you think? And let's talk it over in a kind of a, the formal uh, style of a Tibetan Buddhism of um, taking a point of doctrine and going back and forth and back and forth and seeing what you can illuminate. Well, I... I've noticed, I think everybody is frightened and everybody's thinking, I only can do one small part of this. In other words, my whole life's effort will not solve climate change. So why not fall into despair? And what I can do is say, there are thousands of you. There are ministries from the future all over the place, from the World Trade Organization to your local preschool and many environmental groups. They're all ministries for the future. It's not a hypothetical, it's an actual name for something we do already. Well, people take courage from that, that, okay, I'm just one brick in the wall, but the wall is real. And uh, if, the, if we win, we will have constructed something like a sustainable civilization on this planet. So, um, well, it's been a, a phenomenal journey. And indeed, once again, Zen has helped me because I tell you what, I'd rather be writing books, but you got to do what the moment assigns you to do. Um, and I've written enough books. So um, I'm trying to stay in the present. Nice, nice. Uh, 
One thing, when, about two years ago, when uh, Ministry for the Future just came out, you know, we were getting, as you know, you live in Davis, California, uh, we were getting wildfires and the pandemic was coming in. And our director, who hopefully will come on in a minute to help us um, a little bit with the questioning, um, he said something really interesting. He says, despair assumes too much knowing. Despair assumes too much knowing. And so it's not really fair for our generation, old timers, to look upon the world with despair because our children will be tasked with making this world livable again. And we have to have faith that they can do that. And I personally do have faith that they can do it. One thing I loved about this book uh, was something that, that I first uh, heard from Carl Sagan, where in 1985, he gave, a, um, uh, he gave a presentation to a Senate committee. Al Gore was on that committee at the time. And he said, the thing about uh, the globe is that it's very, very fragile. It's very, very sensitive, much more so than, than we realize. And the problem with global warming is that it's not only international, so many nations have to get together to figure. It's multi-generational. And there's a part in the book that's really great that Mary and Dick, two of the protagonists, um, Dick says, I like to think of it as kind of a rugby match with present day people as New Zealand All Blacks playing against a team of three-year-olds who represent the people of the future. We're the ministry for the future, so we step in and play for the three-year-olds, you know. We substitute for them. And then Bottom later says that within the Indian culture, uh, people always thought seven generations ahead and seven generations back. And I, I really love that because if we can just take responsibility for future generations, somehow, somehow a way will be found, right? Yeah, I, I, I think um, that especially this Indian phrase, um, the seven generations, which seems to me to be Paleolithic and trans- a cultural in that you find it in many cultures indigenous cultures especially um it, the interest the seven number is magical but it's also the um, about the limits of what you can imagine in that okay your children then your grandchildren you go a few more generations out you can still uh, feel them in your mind and imagine them because if you say all the future generations of humans if we get through this bottleneck um, you know, the average lifetime of a species is around 10 million years, and there's sharks and cockroaches, 300 million years. If if we were to get through this bottleneck and to thrive on this planet um, uh, and just take off the table the other planets, just stable, thriving on this planet, like those long-lived creatures, um, difficult but not impossible, you get up quickly into quadrillions or quintillions of humans and it becomes impossible to feel it and certainly our emotional lives are crucial to what's going on uh, uh, cognition we now understand is emotional and and rational at the same time working together and you don't think well if you're emotionally deranged or distanced from your emotions so the feel of the seven generations as a kind of family or your descendants in a genealogical chart where it doesn't explode off into the quadrillions, but is still, oh yes, that's my great, 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 great granddaughter right there. And she's living a good life because of what we did now, because we are in a terrible bottleneck of biosphere destruction that we have to get through successfully, a kind of narrow gate to the north, a, a great semi-Buddhist Japanese text. Um, that is a wonderful way to um, frame your understanding so that you can take on the future without being completely wiped out by it. You, uh, you gave a talk a few months ago about what you've learned since the Ministry to the Future was uh, published. And it's interesting because I read a, an article which is a pretty scathing article about carbon, uh, carbon coins and, and um, you know, that whole, um, that whole market, which you propose in the book pretty heavily. And, 
and uh, it was in the uh, New Yorker called Hot Air uh, just a, a few weeks ago by Heidi Blake. Uh, but I got a presentation by a, a blockchain um, software developer who's in a company and he gave me the presentation and he said that these banks, despite, you know, these ups and downs, short term ups and downs to the market, these banks are looking to contribute trillions of dollars collectively today. This is what they're proposing to uh, somehow address, you know, the climate uh, crisis. And um, in this talk, you said that you've learned a lot of stuff. Can you share with us some of the stuff you've learned that that is happening today? Yeah, I can. And I I must say, I haven't read that article by Heidi Blake. I thought I had, but um, it, cryptocurrency, which is to say private currencies often based on the blockchain, I have no faith in whatsoever. And if she's criticizing that, I'm completely on board with her. It's some kind of libertarian scam in my mind. I'm always talking about fiat money, which is to say government-backed money. And in this world, you can just call it the U.S. dollar. Um, and the central banks are crucial. And during the 2008 crisis and in the 2020 crisis, we invented quant or named quantitative easing, which is the central banks making up a whole bunch of real money and giving it out either to the banks to keep them from going bankrupt or to individuals as during the pandemic to keep them from going bankrupt. And quantitative easing worked. Um, there were some adjustment problems afterwards, but nothing major really. And with that, those lessons in mind, uh, you could do carbon quantitative easing. You could indeed have the central banks of the world, and luckily they're working on this. This is not my idea. It's not hypothetical anymore. There's a thing called the Network for Greening the Financial System. It's 90 of the biggest central banks and a kind of a think tank or a, a network or consortium for ideas. They put out a white paper, how to green money at the source. And so the carbon coin of my novel is somewhat of a symbol for all these other financial instruments. It's not as if the particular device that Mary Murphy and her team gets the central banks to accept in the novel is the only one or the necessary one. In my book, and this comes from 2019, you draw down a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere, you get paid one carbon coin, and the central banks back it to the extent that it will be worth more than you paid to draw down that ton of CO2. You can make money drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere, individual, town, nation state. And it, the more carbon coins that the central banks had to make and back, the more CO2 would be being sucked out of the atmosphere and the better off the climate would be. So we're paying ourselves to do green work. And the, I cannot tell you how many instruments to do that I have run across now in reinsurance industry, uh, hedge fund investment firms, green investment of all kinds, and the central banks. I've talked to people at the Fed, the World Bank, the IMF. The IMF already has a thing called special drawing rights which is a, a particularly vague bureaucratic name for giving out new money to countries in distress to keep them from defaulting on their debts. That could also be done for, or they could, that money could be entailed and say, you, here, you, this is a loan you don't have to pay back, which is the case, but you have to spend it on green projects first and give your people jobs. Well, since it's already happening, I find it even easier to defend the plan that's uh, described in Ministry for the Future. And in my book, I had Mary Murphy fighting for a decade. And indeed, it was the, like the 2030s to get this system uh, accepted and initiated. In reality, it's happening already. And all the dates in Ministry for the Future are completely wrong. Things are going way faster. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's a good thing. The pandemic did that to us. Um, it speeded everything up and people became aware that climate change is a real problem, not just a future problem. It's our problem. And between that and the catastrophes that hitting, I just read um, um, 18 uh, major catastrophes of more than a billion dollars damage a year in the United States alone. Uh, and the yearly damages, this is why the reinsurance companies are freaking out. They can't possibly afford to pay out the premiums to the insurance companies that they're backing. 
So um, we are in a different world. And Ministry for the Future is indeed a novel from 2019, like before the Great Divide. And what it's describing um, is, I think, still useful as a thinking machine, as a way to conceptualize the future. But it's already historicized. The dates in it are wrong. The plans are, uh, the real plans are much more elaborate and multivalent. So it, I think it stands there now as a kind of a symbolic story, like a gigantic prose poem. It could be like this. Uh, and then once you get that in your head, you go out in the real world. It's, it's always this way with novels to reality. The novel is a microcosm and partial. And the world is always way bigger and way more complex. So the fact that ministry is is no longer even an accurate uh, model, it doesn't matter to me. And people are still finding value in it. And it's a it's a novel from 2019. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you write in chapter 99, assuming success for discussion's sake, what shape might it take? The shape of failure. Expand on that, please. The success made of failures. <laughs> uh, yes, a cobbling together from less than satisfactory parts. A slurry, a bricolage, an unholy mess. And in a way, you know, we've got a term. In fact, our podcast is, uh, is called this. It's, um, it's uh, meeting the inconceivable. Meeting mm -hmm. the inconceivable. Discovering the inconceivable. And mm -hmm. that is how we will move our way forward, I think, is we're going to have to be open to meeting the inconceivable. Um, I wanted to bring John Tarrant in to, um, to add or uh, pose any questions that he might have. It's always nice to have him on the call. Yes, there we are. There you are. Good deal. Uh, good. My comments are about the Ministry of the Future rather than some of your other great stuff. So, um, <coughs> the uh, actually, I found it it was quite it was a great quite a ride for me because first of all it was incredibly depressing because it was getting me to face all these things i know you know <laughs> and i was at the national university in australia talk, we were talking about climate change in 1972 <laughs> and the inevitability of it and the opinions were well, we'll probably get it together you know? <laughs> so, the, so there was that quality and then really optimistic you know <clears throat> And uh, and I think so, and I think that's kind of wonderful, you know, just to say, you know. And, Thank you. Uh, and yeah, I can see how you know the different characters. I was struck. I was really interested by the guy who survives. The only you know the the fine guy who survives the heat wave and is a complete train wreck and then murders a person or two and things like that. And uh, but um, and you're. But your main, you know, Mary, the main character, I suppose, is um, her empathy for him really. You know, all these thoughts in her head saying he's terrible and he's going to kill me and that sort of stuff. But there's tremendous empathy, and she goes and visits him when he's arrested and things like that. And I thought, I thought that was a kind of mark. That was a good thing. It mm -hmm. made the novel a novel in a way, you know, yeah, you know, and uh, and made and just got sold in it, like that, like that sort of quality and, and how we have to. have empathy for those we, we we don't always agree with, or maybe we have to agree with those we don't agree with. And, and so I just wanted to, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but uh, I have other questions and comments. But yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that tremendously because that is the novelistic strand. Those two characters are the heart of the, this novel as novel. And a novel has to have characters, has to have a plot. And this novel that is a grab bag as a, as a, a um, as conceived, it still needed a through line of characters interacting with each other. And Mary and Frank, with the they meet by him kidnapping her for a night where easily, when that happens, women get killed. She doesn't like it at all. She survives it, but it is her own uh, trauma to deal with. And later when he's uh, caught and jailed, that she goes to visit him is curious to even to her. And then I did a lot of reading about Stockholm Syndrome, where the kidnappers develop a sympathy for their uh, hostages. And then Lima Syndrome, where the uh, kidnappers, well, the reverse, what I said it wrong before, 
In Stockholm syndrome, the hostages develop a sympathy for their kidnappers. In Lima syndrome, the kidnappers develop a sympathy for their hostages. And I thought of this relationship as being between Mary and Frank as transgressive and weird. When I wrote those scenes, I didn't know what they would say to each other. I didn't know what I was doing. I felt like I was on dangerous ground to suggest that a relationship could develop after something like that, as a, after a start like that. But a, a relationship does develop, and I felt like it was valid and unique. It wasn't just the syndromes. It was these two characters uh, kind of feeling their way forward in a uh, a, a mutual regard because it goes on for decades, really, maybe 20 years. And and so for me, this was uh, crucial because in the end, I'm a novelist and this political advocacy, this scientific uh, news bringing that I do, which I enjoy, it's still uh, uh, tools on the way to doing a good novel. Uh, so I don't mean to be uh, trivializing things, but I it's novels that I care about most of all. That's my practice. And indeed, the last thing I can say about Zen practice or meditation is when I'm writing my novels, very often the whole thing is get out of the way, remove yourself and see what happens. So even my writing, which of course has taken up the bulk of my daily life for 40 years now, I, I regard that as also some weird kind of a Buddhist practice. That's great, yeah. And I think we have to have sympathy for empathy for people <clears throat> that we never expected to have empathy for, you know, and, yeah. and that's out to, you know, the animals and the insects and the you know, yeah. snakes, whatever, whoever it is, you know, so there's that. So, so I, I, I thought that was, it was very emblematic that, you know, in that way of something good that we need to do in a way, you know, so, so a, a couple of the other things I thought were, um, there's that thing about how, you know, we, we always, people are, you know, as a Zen teacher, people are always recruiting me for their cause, you know, and uh, <laughs> I'd like you to hate this group for me. <laughs> to support me. And, and so, so I, I like the way the group, well, you know, um, uh, certain kinds of selfishness are not going to survive, but, you know, humans do have to work together and do it together. It's such a crucial, crucial thing, experience, really, for us that we have to find the virtue in people that we we may not have been willing to find virtue in. Mm -hmm. so I felt the book, your book, had great stuff like that. And the other thing is that that the, you know, the Zen thing. My take on Zen is, you know, I came into it because I don't know. A lot of reasons but i was very involved in the great issues of my other time then and, and stuff and and uh I, particularly i was working for aboriginal land rights in australia and we were all crazy and we we're meeting in pubs and everybody get drunk and stuff fighting physically and things like that and i thought hmm i gotta do something with my mind <laughs> you know <laughs> and uh and so we did and uh and it wasn't always like that but there was a certain unhinged like despairing quality that people get when they despair and uh, but you know it kind of got that situation is not great but it still got moved forward moved moved forward and uh, I think it's from there's you know, something for me about having to work with my mind rather than what the other guys were doing wrong what was was crucial and uh, and I I noticed that in your thing about let's Zen is not just the temples maybe some beautiful isolated sort of cauldron or something in which you develop something but it's got to happen outside the temples and and, uh, and it's got to happen in in dealing with you know politics and all those unsatisfactory and unsavory kind of thing and deals and things like that so so i i just really like that quality of the book you know and i think you're, that's in your work generally yeah well thank you thank you well, amongst all the other things, it's quite clear to me that Buddhism is a kind of political action. It's like science. It's politics by other means. You try to influence other people. You try to uh, have a, a larger impact than yourself on the way society gets along with each other by way of empathy, by Buddhist principles as a political principles, the whole thing with nonviolence, the, the interest that Thoreau had in uh, Indian 
um, uh, nonviolence, the uh, satyagraha. These these are um, um, political strategies that are become all the more important in a world that is stressed out and violent. And despair is never appropriate. It's a kind of a failure of, uh, of imagination or uh, a little bit of a moral uh, giving upness. And yet amongst young people I'm running into now, there's a lot of what I guess I would call climate dread. And dread might be more usefully in train to good political action. Okay, I dread the way this world is going. How do I change it? And then if you can bring to them principles of peaceful non-cooperation, of just walking away, as the Dalai Lama says, uh, don't do what consumer culture asks you to do. Uh, look within and, and get your pleasures from simple non-commercial things, non-consumption things. It all adds up to a political program that I'm I'm completely behind. And so the the book is a is a grab bag. I mean, uh, many people have only read Ministry for the Future. It's one of my weirdest novels structurally, and I'm glad that it worked for people as a novel. But um, it is a grab bag, and so you can pull strands out of it and maybe follow them. But it's not the most coherent thing I ever wrote, not by a long shot. It's fine, you know. I've read other things. It's good, you know. It's all right. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, the coherence is not the, the only virtue in a novel. You know? <laughs> so, no, no. So, Luckily for me, <laughs> the other thing I wanted to put a plug in for was um, that thing about you said about you know Zen Zen can be imported from Japan as a sort of medieval museum of minimalist gestures or something like that. You know? and and it became you know those of us who've I'm a lifer, and so, and so you know, the, we thought um, this can't be right, you know, <laughs> and uh, this can't be what the old masters were thinking, you know, they were always yeah. in trouble. Uh, and uh, and so so the thing about bringing kids in and things like that has been really important, I think. Like that kids, um, the 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 attention you bring bring to having a child attention you if you're walking with a child or playing with a child that's the attention you have in in the dojo you know that kind of thing and i thought i think that's been a huge move in an important move for, for people to get so otherwise it's just a young men's military club <laughs> so. yeah you don't want that well here gary snyder has been just a tremendous exemplary figure for me he watching him i see how to do it and he's very uh humorous about it very high light touch very high humor oh my god i sat on my butt in kyoto for all of my 20s what was i doing and he makes light of it but on the other hand that's where he was putting together his whole mind and meeting his wife etc so he's jokey about it but he's serious too and um his um high humor and and his attention to family have been just amazing to watch and i i had the the unusual privilege of being asked to go visit the dalai lama in a small group international campaign for tibet and tibet policy institute a little green conference and the dalai lama said well the buddha was a green for sure uh, i'm quite convinced of it and he came out and we had an audience with him that was a couple of hours i think all told although it went by in a flash and was kind of outside of time in the way that he can do a rather extraordinary person um and uh he's got dealt such a strange hand in life and he played it so well but one of the main things that struck me and now he's whatever 87 i guess was how much he wanted to make people laugh he was just like a borscht belt comedian uh, running joke after joke sticking his tongue out you know waggling his fingers in his ears to make certain points making puns in english and um fooling around he wanted to make us laugh this was um preeminent in his desires in that particular session and i had seen him before in washington dc speaking to a crowd of ten thousand in a basketball arena he was great there too and equally humorous but in person you know 15 years later it seemed almost to be to be his main goal in life which is interesting right it's um I think stand up is one of the main ways he teaches the Dharma. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he always does that. He's, 
he's got a mask on for some, you know, some epidemic reason or something, but he's wearing it up here on his head. And so, <laughs> that's a <laughs> thing. So he's like, the, yeah. I, I, the thing I wanted to tell you, you know, you mentioned, you know, you bring in <laughs> another ancestor, Walt Whitman, one of the other great ancestors and, uh, and of the, the Sierras as, uh, as themselves in a way, ancestors of the mountains and forests and things. And yeah, I think that's, um, I think, I think you know, that numinous quality where you get taught something by going into the wilderness happens in all sorts of wildernesses. And, uh, you know, you're very eloquent. And my partner, you know, has gone to the Sierras over and over and over again. for, <laughs> And uh, and she makes that case to me. But, and I had that experience in Australia in the forests and uh, mm -hmm. places like New Guinea and things like that where it changes you and you... you you, you're not stuck in this small, my small opinions about what I am and things like that because you're part tree or you're part yeah. kangaroo or whatever it is, you know, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and you mentioned Walt Whitman. Um, I, in my New York novel, he became the guiding spirit, uh, the ghost poet, because he was a New Yorker. And there's a poem of his called Crossing Brooklyn Bridge. Or no, at that point, maybe it's Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Um, it's a poem out of Leaves of Grass, like all of them are. And as he on the ferry, he says, ah, people 500 years from now will be doing this. People, um, and, and remember me and think about the same thing. They'll be thinking the same thing I'm thinking. It's a cosmological poem. Uh, Whitman had an, an incredible um, ability to see the... Um, people in the kind of species sense. Uh, and it wasn't just the nation. It was more the species, humanity. It's it's um, it's a, one of the greatest of... Uh, I, I Occasionally I would read this uh, poem, which I had stuck as an epigraph into my New York novel. And it was actually overwhelming to read. I, I could not keep myself at enough of a distance. And maybe that it was someone else's work and not my own. But I had to stop reading it because it was too overwhelming. And audiences don't really yeah. want to see you break down on stage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of great, though, isn't it? It's yeah. great to be taken over by something like yeah. that. Something yeah. real and good and bigger than ourselves. You know? Yeah, and beautiful. Well, I, I, I think I want to hand it back to John, and thank you so much. It's really, really moving and beautiful to hear you. A great pleasure, and and thanks for your stories about Merwin. I'm going to remember them, write them down, and treasure them. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. John, did you, did you want to ask somebody else if they want to? Yeah, um, I, I know that <clears throat> David Hinton might be on the call. He signed up. There is a David. Um, wave your hand, David Hinton, if you're on the call. We'd love to love to hear from you. Also, if anyone has any further questions, we've got a few minutes. There's a few comments I think we can all see. Running Frisbee golf is just like KSR wrote about in 50 degree, degrees below zero. That's so um, true. <laughs> uh, be a lamp under yourself. Always nice to keep that in mind. It's interesting that KSR, as a science fiction writer, does not believe people will ever colonize other worlds. Yeah. Yeah, you know, John, uh, uh, Todd Geist has read everything. <laughs> yeah. he, he might have a question. Do you want to ask him if he's got a yeah, question? Yeah, Todd, can you, are you able to unmute yourself? Or let me ask you to unmute. There you go. I just finished listening to the audio edition of Ministry for the Future. And I have to say it was it was quite good. Um, the cast does a great job, and I think there's there's um, there's something wonderful about what audiobook performance is becoming in some way as an art form, and people are really taking it to to a high level. And I think the cast did a great job on, on this book. And there was one, there's two parts that that um, uh, just sort of structurally and, and maybe emotionally also just really struck me. One was the conversation between. The, the two people, uh, John Joseph just read one line from them about the two that are constantly arguing back and forth. Yeah. And the actors were just so great in that. How did you come up with, with like, like what, like I was thinking, I was listening to this, like, how do you decide just to put this in the middle of a book and have these two characters be 
uh, so different, but sort of able to tell a story uh, together in some way. Well, thank you for that, because there is an origin story there. It, ministry is a um, an anthology of genres, a grab bag of genres. There's riddles, there's meeting notes, there's ordinary scenes, there's the eyewitness accounts, very important to me. And there are these um, transcriptions of, of uh, conversations between what I thought of as the smooth host and the grumpy guest, like on a radio program. <laughs> and right, right. Um, this is the origin for it. There, I read a book called Orwell at the BBC, and during World War II, uh, George Orwell ran a radio program, and he had guests, and they would talk about books. And uh, the regular guest was a, a professor and literary critic who's pretty famous, William Empson, uh, a, a Brit like uh, Orwell, and a crusty old professor, apparently, the grumpy guest. So Orwell was unflappable, and he would say, I hear that Dylan Thomas's poetry is just meaningless. It's just uh, pretty words, uh, sounds in a row. It doesn't mean anything. And and Empson will say, well, only a stupid person would say that. And then Orwell would say, well, yeah, so I just said it. And and then Empson would say, yes. And he would just leave it at that. And so I read these dialogues, and I thought I was impressed mostly by Orwell's complete ability to uh, let Emson's rudeness bounce off of him and even make it hilarious. Um, it's an unexpected skill on Orwell's part. And I thought, I'm using that format. I want to put it into my novel uh, and make it one strand of, of uh, commentary. Because the grumpy guest begins to say stuff that everybody's thinking about the world, but nobody really wants to say because it's too rude and too, uh, you know, too unfriendly. And I wanted that voice in there also. It was really great. I, it was very, it was very funny and also informative. Like you know, I think it, I think it served its purpose. There was one other part in the audiobook that I found incredibly moving. In fact, that I, I really started just to tear up. There's a section I don't know three quarters of the way through, where um, people are showing up at a meeting or it's not actually clear, and they're just announcing who they're representing, mm -hmm. and the cast is from you know characters from all over the world, and um, and. And I'm I'm pretty sure I did, didn't check every one of them, but these are real organizations. Yeah. In some, at least in some cases, these are real organizations. And it was just so moving to hear all of the all of the people um, from all over the world doing something even today, right now. And it, it just was uh, it was very moving, and it gave me a lot of a lot of hope. Well, thank um, you. To hear uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I tell you, you are not the first. Chapter eighty five. I mean, it's a. I thought of it as just a. The other genre is a list, and I went to get Google Maps. I found a I found a thing online. Somebody had put a, a a point in the map for every environmental organization on Earth that had a little explanation for themselves on YouTube. So it was researched on the internet. It probably is only one tenth of the environmental organizations on Earth, but they all had YouTube videos, and I listed them just alphabetically. And the voices on that audio book have all. It's all in English, but they are all the accents that have come to English from the rest of the world, the way it's the lingua franca, the scientific language, the way we talk to each other. Like I was just with a Norwegian person and a Polish person, and they would have been speaking English to each other even if I wasn't there. So that was a beautiful experience. I, too, uh, found it very moving to hear it read aloud rather than just eyeballing it on the page. It doesn't have the same effect. Uh, Stan, uh, we'd love to hear your Wu Wei poem, your Wu Wei translation. Could you? Sure, sure, sure. I can. I can say that I've I've read a, um, uh, uh, some of David Hinton's translations and um, uh, loved them. And I myself translated I uh, "Source of the Peach Blossom Stream." This is by Wang Wei, the famous Chinese poet who um, wrote this one in seven eighteen in the Common Area dating. So Tang Dynasty, a very great time. And Wang Wei is um, one of the most famous of the Chinese poets of that era for English language readers because he's been translated so often. And Source of the Peach Blossom Stream is, I regard it as one of the very first um, utopian documents. It actually is Wang Wei adapting and translating an earlier short story uh, by, I think, a Tang Fei, uh, from 400 AD. And what I want to point out is this story of the lost uh, paradise 
um, you, of course, we have it in the Bible, but also it's everywhere on earth. Um, there's a story that I read once of um, a, a little uh, hot springs valley in the backside of Greenland where Eskimos and Vikings were living together in peace. And um, the the paradise, it's a bale. So in Tibetan Buddhism, the bale is the magic place, but it's not tied to one locality. It's more a human accomplishment a social accomplishment of peace. And so Wang Wei wrote up the story and it's been translated in English about 20 times. I read all the translations into English, including the ones that are really quite um, an attempt to give you just the source word in Chinese with usually three or four options. And then um, I went away and I, 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 when I sat down, I wrote it from memory in my own English. And so this is what I got. Wandering, we came on a swift river, clear water, granite pebble bottom, riffles and rapids and long steel pools, willows hanging over the banks, big fish tucked in the shadows and floating down like little boats, peach blossoms, lots of them. We climbed upstream to find the trees dropping these petals of floating pink. The river narrowed, rose into a defile. We had to clamber one side, then the other, feet wet at crossing hands on rock, looking down. Then the gorge opened and we were in a high valley. Fields of grain, neat houses, and yes, peach trees. They lined the banks, dropping their blossoms on the slow meander of a little river. People came out to greet us. Where are you from? What's the news? They fed us and showed us a bower to sleep in. These people were peaceful, calm, kind. The valley was fertile and full of animals. We stayed until we saw what it was, a good place. To live here would be fulfillment. So we said to each other, let's get our families and bring them back. Let's move here. We left that place and picked away down the narrow gorge back into the world, traveled home and made our accounting, convinced till we could to go back with us. Off we went with packs on our back, back to the place where the peach blossoms fell. We could not find it. Somehow the hills were not the same. No such river where we thought. Back and forth we made a search, back and forth, but nothing. Different streams, different lands. That place in space was a moment in time. You can never find your way back. Search all your life, you will only despair. Precious Bale, how did we find you? And where did you go? Thank you. Thank you. Any final words, John Tarrant? Oh, just thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's a beautiful story about eternity, the nature of eternity. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Kim Stanley Robinson, for coming on our series. It's been just wonderful. And uh, so we'd love to uh, love to have you again sometime. Uh, so. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I hope and trust. I feel certain that you all can tell that for me, this has been a special uh, encounter to be able to talk about these things rather than other things and come at it. The world from this angle means a lot to me. So um, many thanks. All right. <laughs> well, good night all. And uh, thank you all for coming. And hopefully we'll we'll get together again soon. <laughs>